Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Fars, Director of Investment Banking here at Red Cloud, and I'm joined by CEO Chris Sternbos of E3 Metals, uh, who's championing a very exciting lithium brine project in Alberta. There's a PA on it. It only contemplates a fraction of what they actually have. And, and Chris has a very exciting uh, roadmap to commercial production via a DLE, extra, direct lithium extraction route, uh, and which we at Red Cloud are very bullish believers on, uh, as we appreciate that this industry certainly needs more of these stories. And, and with that, Chris, please uh, take it away. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, E3 Metals is, as Joe mentioned, a lithium development company focused in Alberta. Um, Alberta is quickly becoming a major jurisdiction for lithium resources. The province currently holds uh, over 30 million tons of, of lithium uh, under resource right now. Um, E3 is leading the charge. We're one of the few companies uh, in the world and one and the only one in this part of the world that has a direct lithium extraction technology that unlocks this a massive value. So we're very excited to be leading the charge, um, but we're also very excited to be growing an entire industry uh, around us here in the province. The reason for that all is because of this aquifer. So this is being built on the Leduc aquifer, which was discovered in 1947 by Exxon Imperial. Um, a lot of times we get coined with the phrase uh, petrol lithium. The reason for that is simply that where we are repurposing um, an asset is an old oil producer. Um, if you talk about geothermal brines, they are repurposing a geothermal. So it just denotes where we're coming from. Where we're going with this, however, is a, a massive brine production. That's our goal. Um, when you look at this aquifer before the discovery of oil at the time, it was still 97 to 98% lithium brine and a few percent oil. It's been produced for 60 years. The oil is pretty much depleted. You have the lithium enriched brine remaining. The real opportunity though, is that the operations of producing lithium to surface and getting it to a process facility is identical to producing oil and gas, which means operationally, we can do exactly the same thing with lithium industry. And the importance of that is, uh, has many certain aspects. Um, one of the big ones is permitting. I can talk to you a bit about the permitting uh, later in the slide, but that is a huge aspect that we have an advantage on. Social license is another big piece of this um, project, which because this is a very mature industry in an in a oil and gas prone, prone province, um, majority of the workforce here works in oil and gas. Um, that allows us to, to, because we operate just like an oil and gas company, to capitalize on that strong social license that's been well established here in the province. There's a strong workforce, local supply of all the materials we need, including drill companies, and all the things we need to do to build a project here, uh, even within kilometers of our project site. The biggest service-centered uh, city in, uh, in Alberta is Red Deer. It's 20 kilometers from the project site. So very, very excited about that, the aspect uh, and prospect of building a lithium project in Alberta. E3, as a company, stands on two big pillars. One, we have a very robust resource base, 7 million tons in the ground under inferred. Um, in 2022, we'll talk about this, but we're planning to extend that uh, inferred and also upgrade a portion of that inferred to measured and indicated. The other piece of this is our technology. So we've been developing a proprietary piece of technology that is under the umbrella of direct lithium extraction. Our specific technology is ion exchange. And it's a really important distinction we're trying to demystify what's in the black box. And I'll take you through a bit of what we're doing here in Alberta and at E3 in, relate to, in relation to that. Um, another big advantage we have is that we plan to make battery grade products. So we take the brine and take it all the way to battery grade, which is unique. Uh, it doesn't happen in the industry today, uh, mainly because infrastructure is lacking in places where lithium is generally produced. Uh, E3 has no lack of infrastructure, no lack of ability to go all the way to the battery grade products. And so that's what we plan to do. The company is very well funded. Um, we've got a very solid small footprint, which means that we have a good SG story to tell you. Uh, and we've been building on a very impressive team over the past uh, 18 months since we've moved on from research and development into commercialization. Um, everyone on this slide uh, comes from the oil and gas industry, save for Jonathan Nielsen. Um, examples are Chris Ward, built, uh, worked on the projects team that built Fort Hills, which is a $17 billion capital project in Northern Alberta. Uh, Peter Ratzlaff, 
uh, expert in producing fluids, 25 years of, uh, of experience producing liquids out of these aquifers here in the province. Uh, Ray Chow is a seasoned uh, financial capital markets project finance, uh, all out of Alberta. We also have 23 people on staff, all of them also hired from the Alberta workforce, except for Jonathan. Um, he's our lithium process expert. We brought him in from FL Schmidt out of the States. He now lives here in Calgary. Uh, he's got 30 years in developing these types of processes, including the last many years working on lithium flow sheets specifically, and more, uh, more in depth on direct lithium extraction with some of our peers. So very excited to have brought him on last year as well to the team. Um, I'm only going to go briefly through the market. There's two big pillars that have sort of founded the real move into the lithium space. One is that all of the technology to make batteries right now for mobile applications, we're talking cars and, and phones and computers, all based on the lithium platform. Um, the other thing is that the major market for lithium batteries due to the, the amount of batteries they consume is the electric vehicle space. And we've seen every OEM in the world commit to electrifying its fleet, at least in part, if not in whole. And the two combined means that there's massive capacity of batteries being built, all based on lithium. What that looks like locally um, is a, a large ramp up in demand for lithium. Um, in North America, uh, the estimates are somewhere between 80 and 90%, sorry, yeah, 80 and 90 percent hydroxide. Uh, that's because the batteries are going to be likely the high nickel cathode um, in the future. And uh, as uh, range becomes uh, something that we, we really want to increase and in the technologies like the NCM811 um, become more commonplace, um, you'll start to see the hydroxide come into play in a much bigger way in, in the future. So E3 is looking today at developing a hydroxide based flow sheet for that reason. Uh, I'm sorry, there's just a lag here, it looks like in the presentation. So um, looking at, uh, as Joe mentioned, our PEA came out last year, um, $1.1 billion NPV for uh, the first phase of the project, just 20,000 tons. Um, that's at a $14,000 price. We're spiking over 50,000 today. I think a long-term price is maybe somewhere in the 20 to 25,000. Um, well above the 14 we used in our PEA, so that value can never increase there with that price uh, as that price goes up for long-term contracts that we might get in the future. One of the big notes on this is our $3,600 per ton operating cost, um, one of the lowest in the industry. And I think that's really important because it allows us to um, survive through long-term production, having a low operating cost. It also gives us a very healthy margin today which allows us to pay down capital quicker and move on to expansion beyond 20,000 tons. Uh, again, this is the process flow sheet. Um, this is where we look like oil and gas is the, pro, the uh, diagram on the left. So we're accumulating fluids from an aquifer. We put it in a pipe, we bring it to a central facility where we extract the lithium out of the brine using our ion exchange process. And then we put the brine back in the aquifer. This is closed loop. So there's no evaporation ponds deployed here. It's a chemical extraction method. Um, and obviously no hard rock mine. So the footprint here is very small um, and allows the farmers who have, who's the main surface use of this area to continue to farm, even though our operation is full steam ahead. <clears throat> um, we make a lithium sulfate. We can also make a lithium chloride. Both of those uh, are precursors to all of the lithium products that you buy into the, you sell into the battery market. So um, lithium carbonate, lithium hydroxide and lithium metal. Um, right now, as I mentioned, our first plan is to build a lithium hydroxide uh, process for phase one <clears throat> based on the local market. Um, and that technology is conventional uh, industry. So we're not uh, that conversion. We're not reinventing the wheel there. We're just going to build something that is industry spec. Um, looking at our technology, um, you know, DLE is a new technology on, on the street in terms of how you produce lithium. Um, we look at this very differently in terms of, uh, you know, we obviously see what's going on internally. We, we have a lot of confidence that we're going to commercialize this technology as we progress. Um, every, every technology out there in this world at one point started off being new, and all of those technologies have become commonplace to what we use today. Um, we think that this is even lower risk than a new tech because it's ion exchange. And when you look at ion exchange processes throughout the world, they're used readily to treat metals out of water 
or fluids. Half of the uranium in the world is treated using ion exchange. Uh, if you have a municipal water treatment, a lot of that is ion exchange. If you have a water softener in your basement, it's ion exchange. So we use ion exchange everywhere, including here locally, which is important for us uh, in terms of our pilot, um, to, to clean up things like frack water and industrial water for the oil and gas industry. So these technologies are deployed readily uh, out there in the world. What is novel to E3 is the little bead that we create. So we create an, uh, a material that is selective for lithium. And in every ion exchange system, the material you put in this process is selective for the metal you're trying to extract. We've developed one that's selective for lithium. So as we run it through this, this material, the lithium binds to the material chemically in an ion exchange process. So you fill a tank full of this material, you flow the brine top to bottom. As the brine flows through the system, the lithium binds to the material. So by the time the brine reaches the bottom of the tank, there's no more lithium in it. Then you put it back in the aquifer and now have all the lithium on the material. Uh, every so often that material fills up with the lithium and then you strip it off. So we use a lot less volume of the strip agent than we do the original brine. So we get all of the lithium in a smaller volume. And that means we've concentrated it. And because the material is just selected for lithium, we get a concentrate that is 60 to 70% pure lithium in sulfate form. Uh, when you compare that to the competitors in the space, like hard rock mines, for example, their spodumene concentrate that they ship out to China is, which is the Australian sort of, where a lot of the hydroxide is being produced today is Australian spodumene being mined, shipped to China for converting. That spodumene that's put on ship is about six to 7% uh, lithium uh, oxide or, or spodumene concentrate. Um, so we are six to, we are 10 times the concentration than our peers in the space. And what that really means is that we can lower our costs because we have a smaller flow sheet to purify. We also have a much simpler process to get to that 60 to 70% concentration. Um, and so we, that's how we're able to get down to that $3,600 per ton. All of this uh, enables us also to make a high pure lithium hydroxide because we've done a, a large amount of that purification in, in this single step. When you look at the bigger picture of what E3 is doing, the technology, obviously something that we're advancing is very important. But another big piece of what we're up to here is the, uh, the development of this aquifer. And you look at the size of this thing, it's, it's massive. We can scale the 20,000 tons based on the brine we have available to us to 150,000 tons per year. And that can run for 35 years. The real potential for us, the real blue sky, is in our uh, expansion potential across this resource, be making us one of the global leaders in lithium production. And then you look at our technology, we believe we can deploy it elsewhere, including locally to other places in Western Canada uh, and enable an industry to grow here on the back of that. Um, the ESG story I've sort of talked about, um, I'm just gonna br br breeze through this because of time. Um, the slide is available to you, but we have a very small surface footprint, no interaction with fresh water, and we're aiming to reduce our carbon emissions to carbon neutrality per ton of lithium produced. So very important. Um, one of the big things about permitting in December, uh, the Alberta government has been very supportive of our project, including $1.8 million in grant funding last year, also passed Bill 82. Bill 82 gave regulatory authority to the Alberta Energy Regulator who regulates oil and gas. Lots of information there. The link here, number one, is for you to go see where all those regulations sit. You can read all about how Alberta permits now lithium as well. Um, the big note here is the time frame for permitting. A well license, which is our ability to produce our minerals, so our mining license, takes uh, four to eight weeks to get if you have all your paperwork in a row. So the time frame to commercial permitting is very much reduced here in Alberta because of um, the, the ability to be under this regulator that's been um, developing this system and has a very streamlined process, as well as because it doesn't have the same surface impact, it requires a lot less development on the um, EIA side of things. I'll let this sit here for um, people to look at uh, later in terms of what we've accomplished over the past 12 months. But looking forward, I think E3 has a very exciting 2022. We've been talking a lot over the past two to three years, for those who've been following in the story, about accomplishing three big major milestones. In the DLE technology, that milestone is a pilot plant demonstrating this concept of technology at scale. And the reason the pilot is so uh, important is because it, the scale up of ion exchange processing is modular. 
So you don't build a bigger machine, you build lots of those same machines. And so we're looking at doing a semi-commercial size in the pilot, which means that we de-risk the scale up of this um, substantially, because if we want to increase production, we just build more of those same. So in the path to do that, we're currently at process optimization. Then we do the pilot plant construction later this year, and then we commission and operate into 2023. Um, on the resource front, uh, we're doing we're drilling three wells here this summer. A lot of the energy and effort we've gone into um, understanding the geology of this uh, resource um, is going to see us hopefully increase our inferred base. And then that leads also to taking a portion of that inferred and converting that to measured and indicated, which is also very important for us. Um, and that happens after our production tests. So that all happens this year. And then the third thing is producing lithium hydroxide. Right now we're going through an optionality study where we're going to look at different potential opportunities that are out there for flow sheet development. So basically that means testing other people's technology with our um, lithium sulfate to see which one we like the best. And then we do the evaluation and optimization work. And then we start giving them lots of concentrate to produce lithium hydroxide at a, at a scalable commercial uh, methodology, um, hopefully by the end of this year. So Although those things are currently underway and we're pushing them as fast as we can, obviously all of that culminates in a pre-feasibility study we want to have out in 2023 detailing this uh, 43. The next step after that is obviously moving into commercial development. So once we have the pre-fees out, that's our checkbox to say go um, in terms of commercial operation. And then we start the permitting process. We start the project finance as we work through the detailed engineering design of the actual plant. And then we hope to be in commercial operations by late 2025 or 2026 at phase one, which is 20,000 tons is our goal right now. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up. And I think I'm just on time. So thanks, Joe. That was, that was great, Chris. Really appreciate the, the presentation. You know, I really liked uh, slide nine. I thought that was a very solid breakdown and you articulated quite well in terms of how, you know, the DLE approach here is, is really quite simplified. Uh, but before circling back to that, I just want to get through a couple of the audience questions here. Um, you know, one of these questions, I guess, if you could provide any color on what you think the price, uh, sort of a you know market price would be, or how you arrive at some sort of a formula for a market price. Would it be uh, OEM driven? Or would it be a spot price? A combination of contract? Like, how do you how do you foresee the pricing of your product to unfold? Today, um, any serious lithium production uh, is usually in long-term contract. And I think that unless a reference price gets established that everyone agrees to, and I know the LME is trying to do that with fast markets, um, until something like that happens, it's probably going to be a, a market or, or a long-term contract um, that you negotiate based on the company you're working with and all those sorts of metrics. Um, you know, I think that that type of price is likely going to be higher than the $14,000, um, mm -hmm. in, at least in the sort of time frame that we're going to be out putting our project into production. Um, but it's hard to get a real gauge of that. Um, the, the price can be volatile, but I think it's going to remain strong for at least the next 10 years, at least strong. I mean, for us, anything above $10,000 is, is a great price for us. So, you know, $25,000. Uh, is sort of where we think the price is going to settle for the 2025 to 2030. And that's a very strong, a very strong price for, for a project like this. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is maybe more of a general um, comment to the equities um, or, or question to the equities. Is there, is there any sort of indication that you're seeing, you know, we've seen a rally in the commodity pricing, uh, but the equities just, you know, continue to, uh, uh, you know, systematically build, but certainly not in the same sort of rallying uh, environment that we saw the, the commodity price. Uh, any sort of comment on that? I think there's a couple things. I think there's, there's a lag in like the, the producers before they start seeing upticks in their revenue from the spot price increasing. And Albemarle was a good example of that. So I think that, you know, that the, the realization of that price in a real sense is, is going to take some time. Um, you know, also we're pre-production, uh, and I think the market understands that, um, you know, the, the, the maturity of, of the market understands that companies like us aren't selling our product today and, and likely won't even on the spot price. 
So having uh, that price spike is maybe not as influential to the market price. I think hopefully we're seeing more of a response to project fundamentals, company fundamentals. Um, what I will say is that nobody out there uh, is dismissive of the lithium market. Everyone believes it's going to be very strong. Um, and that is continuing. So that is an open, continually opening up more doors for financing uh, for companies like us that need to build a project. That's great. One last one, Chris, uh, maybe just highlighting the commercial production element of the DLE. Uh, I'm assuming that there's been, you know, questions on uh, not just your particular story in DLE, but, uh, you know, DLE in general and its commercial ability. Can you highlight uh, what you feel are the misunderstood advantages that you have, um, you know, dealing with the, the, the product and process that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest hindrance that we, we face is that it's new, right? So there's no commercial DLE technology out there. Um, I think that's, that's not going to be the case. I think the benefit of DLE is its simplification of the process flow sheet as a whole. For example, our process from our sulfate to hydroxide actually recycles a big portion of our reagents back through the system, um, which means that we can simplify the entire process down to something that looks very nice assuming we go electrical method to make hydroxide. So um, I think DLE is a matter of time and it's going to become a big portion of the new lithium supply brought into the market. And it's not fit for purpose for every brine. Um, you know, aquifer fundamentals drive your DLE because you have to put your brine back somewhere, which in a conventional solar, you don't, you evaporate it off. So there are some challenges for certain aquifers, especially some of the historic um, ones that are already producing brines using evaporation, um, they're likely going to be around for quite some time as they continue to operate um, and they're established. But I think new supply of lithium into the future. There's also a lot of synergies with, you know, where we are, we're able to actually have cathode manufacturing uh, attached to our plant, for example. And I think that vertical integration is going to be a very important story into the future as the lithium market as a whole, including the battery market evolves. Right now it's very mature. The new market, the new supply, everything is coming up new. And I think you're going to start to see that evolution move towards manufacturing, towards the source where you can. And in Alberta, you can. So we have that opportunity as well to grow a bigger portion of E3's offering, I guess, as it were, into the future.